Welcome to the AOC podcast mini series. I'm Frankie Walker, Senior Public Affairs Officer at GIST, and today we will be exploring digital poverty. Joining me today is Dr. Maxine Room, CBE, Associate Director from Black Leadership Group, and also joining me today is Paul McKean, Director for FE and Skills at GISC. Welcome. So we know that digital poverty is a huge issue in the UK. Um, according to Zebra, 5.8% million um, are estimated um, to, be, to remain digitally excluded by 2032. With the onset of emerging technology such as AI, many want to know what this means for digital poverty. So that leads me on to my first question. How does AI have the potential to reduce or exacerbate digital poverty? Okay, so um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about digital poverty today. Um, As you say, um, I'm Dr. Maxine Room, CBE, and I've been working in the education space for a long time. As I've just heard from one of the speakers, I'm sort of between a baby boomer and a Gen Z, I think, um, (laughs) in terms of my thinking, if not my age. Um, Digital poverty does have the ability to exclude people, and AI is a part of that. And... What I've been thinking about um, in terms of uh, what it, how it affects young people and adults, because I think it's multi-generational, which was another thing that the speaker was just talking about previously. It's multi-generational. It's no one generation is excluded from digital poverty. With the growth of something like AI, and I'm working in the technology space, I'm um, a sort of teacher turned techie, but not in the, um, I'm not, I've not got those real uh, technology skills but I understand what it can do and I'm really excited about AI but if we don't find ways in which we can include rather than exclude some people simply by cost by um, things like um, having software hardware having uh, the ability to access data you know in a multi-generational household it's really difficult for some young people and adults to actually be able to access the things they need to access um, whether it be AI or other technologies to support whatever they want to do and particularly in education I think that's that's a big problem and we sometimes assume that one size fits all we teach to groups Mm -hmm. assuming that everybody has access to be able to do their assessment etc because they have the hardware software so it's it's going to exacerbate the digital divide rather than close the gap I I absolutely agree uh, Maxine I think we really have to look at the, the foundations and the fundamentals that need to be in place to, to kind of reduce digital poverty in the first yeah. place before yeah. we even start to talk about AI yeah. and the affordances yeah. mm-hmm. and benefits, which undoubtedly they are. So I represent JISC on the All Party Parliamentary Group for Digital Inclusion. And one of the key things that we look at is access to devices. So that is actually getting a, a, a device to be able to use in the first place. That device needs connectivity. So that's mm. two things that we need to think about before we think about AI. But then there's digital skills and there's also a safe place to access this technology. So we did a uh, a report uh, in 2020 during COVID and they were the key things that learners were telling us about Mm. their participation. Mm. They either didn't have the device, they didn't have the connectivity Mm. or they didn't have a safe place to learn. Mm. So these are things that we need to have in place prior to sort of moving on to AI positively. There has been work done in that space. We now have social tariffs. Yep. Mm. That means people on a certain means tested benefits are able to get access to affordable connectivity, mm. albeit there is still a, a cost in mm. that space. We have great work done by think, uh, organizations such as the Good Things Foundation mm. that work with all of the mobile operators these days to provide access to free data. Mm. And I urge any of the listeners today, if you ha- are struggling in that space, do contact uh, the Good Things Foundation or the, your local uh, mobile provider, and they will offer free data for up to 12 months, mm. which is which is a fantastic opportunity. And then, of course, we've got the once you've got the foundations in place, it's the digital skills that people yeah. need. Mm. And the point um, that you you asked um, Frankie around uh, AI and the the opportunities and forwards into that space. One of the key things is about AI literacy. Mm. Mm. People need to understand what AI can do and how to manage it in an effective way. In the same way in the past we've talked about information literacy and the importance of judging information on its merits and and having sort of triangulation of data and and trustworthy. 
in this uh, era of AI, and particularly when elections and other mm -hmm. things are, are coming about, we need people to understand the AI literacy to know what they can trust that's out there. So to, to, to kind of um, answer your question, I think there are absolute opportunities to close the digital divide using mm -hmm. the benefits of AI, but as in, in agreement with Maxine, we could exacerbate it if we don't get the, the basics right in the first place. I think imp an important point that both of you raised was the cost mm. of these digital tools actually being a barrier. So GIS AI team did find that, you know, if students were to get the basic AI tools, it would cost them around £1,000 a year. Um, what do you think are other barriers um, to accessing digital tools and resources and how do you think we can overcome this? I think there's, there's something around um, leadership here in terms of understanding what it is, uh, for example, learners actually need and how how we as leaders in the spaces or, you know, um, whatever organisations we're working with and for, how we can support that understanding for leaders. Because I talk to a lot of people who simply do not understand the landscape, mm. do not understand technology, do not understand AI and what it can do. Um, and, and are therefore not positioned probably to make a difference. I think there's something about coming together. I mean, I think GIST does an, an enormous amount of good work in collaborating and bringing organisations together to understand that whole technology piece. It's really moving at a pace. You know, the, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution in my organisation as a startup. I work with developers, um, I work with project managers who are who are sort of navigating that space every day. But in the wider world, you know, just looking at the, the different generations and their understanding of it, how can we collaborate together to, um, to make it work in a better way for everyone? So um, I don't know what Paul, Paul thinks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And again, I think leadership is a, is a really uh, key thing to focus on because mm -hmm. I think leaders of organisations need to understand the benefits and affordances and, and quite yeah. often they don't. Mm. They're, they're hit with this technology. It's AI, it's brilliant, yeah. it's amazing, what can it do? Well actually, what problem are you trying to solve? So, yeah. mm. And I think that's the question we need to ask yeah. ourselves in the first instance. And actually to, to come back to your, your question Frankie, the problem we're trying to solve is yes. it's about inclusion. Yeah. We're trying to make a fair access for everybody mm. to education. Forget the technology for a minute. Mm -hmm. It's about giving everybody equal opportunities. Yeah. And things like AI can provide and support uh, that equality mm. because if we're giving people effectively a digital assistant I've got my phone in my hand mm. for those who are listening online mm. and you know, this this uh, this tool can help me access education yeah. in a number of ways we've got really good examples of where free to access and inclusive uh, technologies and AI for example the, the uh, Microsoft Translate is being used with ESOL learners mm. in Hull College so they're uh, in using that tool, they're enabling the ESOL learners to integrate into college life really quickly and effectively. So in, in, to give an example, they were going through induction, coming to college to learn English because mm. they didn't understand English, but their induction yes, was provided in, in English. English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of going through it from a lip service perspective yeah. rather than a true understanding. Yeah. Having access to the technology and it being translated mm -hmm. simultaneously for them, they're actually engaging in that experience. Yeah. Yeah. They were able to build relationships very quickly, and mm -hmm. actually, I'm sure lots of people recognise isolation is a, is a real problem yeah. for, for people who are coming into this, uh, it, in, in this country from asyl as asylum seekers and, mm -hmm. and other, um, that have other barriers to education. So having the leadership in the organisation mm -hmm. to say, we need to adapt and actually have something in place that enables and is, is almost frictionless for yeah. the engagement of these students. So cost doesn't have to be a barrier, but just no. to pick back on your mm. point, uh, Frankie, we do have to be aware that when AI uh, systems and tools are free, there is a cost and it's often mm. our own data. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important, going back to the AI literacy mm. point, that we educate people about what is happening with our data mm. when we're using and engaging with them kind mm. of tools. So I think that's a role for leaders in organisations, mm. not just to adopt it because it's free, because it's mm. easy, yeah. and we have to think about, so what, what is that organisation doing with our data? Mm. Are the learners and the members of staff in the organisation that are engaging with it aware of what's happening? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it is their personal data. 
And I think that one of the things that you alluded to is the intersectionality of deprivation and disadvantage. So, um, you know, if you think about my case, you know, I'm a, um, sitting between a baby boomer and a, I don't know what, a millennial <laughs> or what, wherever. But um, I grew up in one of the poorest boroughs in London um, to a single parent mother uh, who was working three jobs in order to, to get what would be considered a minimum wage as a black female. And decades later, if I was that child, I would be impoverished in terms of digital, uh, the digital divide. Uh, it, it still, for some people, is about that intersectionality of deprivation that is a cost in lots of different ways. So, you know, we need to look at that. And, and one of the things that I've been thinking about as I've been working with United over the last two and a half years, we really want to embed diversity, equity, inclusion, which is cliche, it's glib, etc. But I really go out of my way in, the, in our little startup to think about how we make our product inclusive, how we open it to a very diverse um, population, we think about the economics of it. Mm. Also, not just equality of access, but, but equity. How can we make it equitable? And how can we make it as accessible as possible, you know, in terms of price point and, and usage, but also this thing about data and privacy. So making it safe and secure, you know, we're GDPR compliant. We don't want to, well, you don't want to keep people's data at all. Now, not every organization or every company that's developing technology or AI is really thinking in those terms. And you're absolutely right. If something is free, you need to think, I always ask the question, well, how does they make their money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how are they making their money i mean i started with chat gbt as a free and now i have chat gbt plus we do work um to keep up with you know all the different bits of ai that there are but it's really tricky and i know that that parents who have um, the capacity and the capability and the change to be able to provide those solutions those technology solutions whether they're uh, um, hardware software or any of the ai applications will do so and those mm -hmm. children have a competitive edge in employment as well mm -hmm. so you know we we need collectively you know and there's the audience here need to think collectively what are they doing to make it as equitable as possible for their students to learn and earn in the future mm. i think just building on that it, inclusivity is really important and again you've got that lack of equity and the starting point can only get worse if everybody mm -hmm. isn't doesn't have that foundation i was at an, uh, an ou ai conference uh, the last week the week before and they, they made a great co uh, comment about ai and they were saying it should be about the eight billion meaning everybody is citizens rather than the eight billionaires, yes. the tech companies. Mm. And that's a really powerful message for us to take away. So as, you, as you've said, you know, it's, what are they doing with the data? It should be for everybody. Yeah. And it should make sure, we should make sure that it, it is the kind of frictionless access mm. that is enabled. It is equity for everybody, giving everybody the opportunity to take um, the benefits away from this. And you, you do need the scaffold in place. I think that's definitely a role for education. It's about providing the guardrails so people use AI ethically and in a, in a safe way because we don't want people just to jump in and to use ChatGPT or whatever, Gemini, whatever the tool is, in an ineffective or unsafe way to maybe use it unintentionally to aid their progression educationally. Some other people might call that cheating, but in a lot of ways people are getting the benefits without realising the, that they're doing things you know, in, in an inappropriate way from an educational and academic integrity type way. I think important point was raised about, you know, disadvantaged students um, not being able to access um, digital tools and being able to use that within education and that acting as a barrier. So I guess that leads on to my last question around um, students and, and education. So do you think AI would widen the student attainment gap? So can I pick yeah, up that, if that's okay? Yeah. So I, I, I think it, it could absolutely, but it, equally it could reduce yes. it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, again, we, we're talking quite a lot about at the moment is somebody is, not necessarily from an affluent background, but somebody has a support network mm. who has a, a parent or guardian to support them. 
they may be doing a piece of work in assignment and they can get their parent guardian an aunt and uncle whoever it is in their family circle to proofread it mm. to actually read through it and say oh here's a suggestion mm. we, we think you may want to concentrate a little bit more on that paragraph because yeah. you've not put as much detail well things like ai can do that for everybody yeah. mm. and actually it's a bit like having a let's say an aunt or uncle on tap yeah. whatever time of day it yeah. is to say can you help me with this yeah. and actually what's wrong with that because human intervention in you know, everyday society is happening in that way. It, yeah. And it's almost a given for people who have that support network. Yeah. But people who don't, we should be providing generative AI tools that can enable that to happen without putting barriers in the way. And I think mm. that's critical. Yeah. But again, it comes back to my point earlier about AI literacies to understand what is appropriate, to test that information, mm. to check that it, you know, that it's appropriate. Just because a generative AI tool gives you an answer doesn't mean it's accurate. Yeah. You mm -hmm. need to test that. Yeah. So it's a good sounding board. Yeah. It's a good opportunity. One of the other things we talk about is getting over blank page syndrome. Yeah. A starting point, it could help you. Yes. But then it's you as the individual, as the learner, mm -hmm. who constructs that assignment, who, mm -hmm. who builds on that sort of case uh, and assessment that you're going to then mm -hmm. um, submit. So I think that's a really key point about mm -hmm utilizing it and giving access to everybody and thinking about as that support mm. that other people haven't got yeah and thinking and as an educator you know getting students to critically assess the information they're being given or wherever they get it from you know they used to google it now they may be using generative AI in, a, in a, ver a variety of different ways, but also using people. It's a hybrid, isn't it? It's no one, no one thing is going to give you the answer. But what you want is to be able to provide something from your learning that is going to help you to get through that assessment or to get through that interview or, or whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And and I think you know the the. The call to action for our leaders is to really think about how they're supporting that 360 degree appraisal of, of learning and, and use of technology, which can be amazing, you know, can really help. I mean, I use it every day. I'm working with it every day. And um, as, I, as I talk from teacher to tech, I never thought that I would be that person at my age. Um, I'm sort of living embodiment of yeah you can do it you can use it in a productive way and help others and i use it in my mentoring and coaching with the blg as well helping people to understand how it can help them to help their students for example so you know there's there's a way of thinking and a mindset i think we ha need to have a, about these these um these new technology tools which will be for the better you know technology for good is is what we want and just, just building on that, Maxie, I think the, the augmentation uh, point that you've raised, mm. uh, the, the sort of hybrid nature thing, I think is really important because from a learner's perspective, the teacher isn't the only person that can actually help you, but you mm. can do some individual study, if you like, and get support yeah. elsewhere. Well, then it can be checked off with the, yeah. with the teacher. Each, equally, from a teacher's perspective, you know, the teacher doesn't have to control the whole no. environment. They can point a learner off to do some research by themselves and they, they're coming back and it's a scaffold of that yep. um, educational experience. Yep. And I think the you know to, to dispel that myth, robots are not going to replace teachers no. in the mm -hmm. same way uh, robots are not going to be the person no. who, who uh, submits the assignment. Your learners are going to be engaged in that. We need to encourage people to work together with generative AI or whatever technology it is. And both, that's from both a teacher perspective, but also from a learner perspective point of view yeah. but what we want to do is en enhance them core skills soft skills critical thinking all yeah. of the, yeah. the the kind of things that we talk about in a variety of ways because they're the things that are important they're the things that employers are looking for mm. and if we can educate our young people and indeed adults mm. it doesn't matter yeah. what age you are these are the kind of skills that um, are going to be helpful in the workforce because people are using these generative AI tools in the workplace so this isn't just about learning with them, this is about knowing how you're going to use them on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Yeah. So we've got a critical role to make sure we include everybody mm. on that journey mm. to make sure, to come back to your earlier point, that we don't exacerbate that mm. digital divide. And um, what I'd like to, you know, sort of finish on uh, um, and build on that point is that leaders from this from this conference and leaders in other um, other spheres go away and think about what do they need to do in their organizations with their staff in order to make this work better for their students and their learners or in schools wherever you know they have a part to play sort of a call to action for them is 
you've got a digital strategy. You know, I've talked to many people here who've got this digital strategy, but it seems to be to be quite piecemeal. So they'll talk about one dimension that they're focused on. It could be immersive learning. It could be the use of Oculus glasses. It could be a use of, you know, all sorts of things. But I'm not sure that they're looking across the strategy and really connecting the dots. Yeah, there's, there's, this isn't directly to relate to what you said, but you've, you've just got a, a thought in my mind. One call to action for me would be to think about the benefits and affordances of a device like this. Yeah. You know, we, we often see, and I, I visit colleges quite frequently, the big sign on the door with the red line through mobile phones because yeah. it said it's a distraction. And I get it, you've got yeah. learning behavior and yeah. we need to address that. And people going on Facebook or TikTok or YouTube or whatever is gonna disrupt the learning environment. But think about that SEND learner. Yeah. Think about that yeah. ESOL learner yeah. who can really benefit by the power of one of these mm -hmm. to help them actually be included in the learner experience. So don't see it as a, as a behavioral issue, see it as a learning benefit yeah. tool. Yeah. And if you come at it from that angle, then you're looking to solve some of the problems that you're already trying to address in other ways. As an ex-principal, I know sometimes I've designed policy one size fits all because I've got a problem and you forget the exclusionary nature of some of that, like use of mobile phones. I mean, I know some schools have said no mobile phones, you know, at all, but actually, if that's the way in which a student who has, who's neurodiverse or has other, other disabilities can communicate, can participate, why would you do that? And I think we need to think much more carefully about those policies that we're applying. Um, like, you know, nobody uses ChatGBT because it's cheating type of approach. So all of that. Right, so this is my final question in one sentence. So we've talked about the importance of leadership in organisations in, ter in terms of driving um, knowledge and expertise in the opportunities and some of the barriers with digital, but also in terms of addressing digital poverty. What policies do you think that the government can introduce to ensure that no one is left behind if they are experiencing digital poverty? So in one sentence. Oh, that's so <laughs> difficult in one sentence. Um, oh... I, th I suppose the policy, it's not just about, I know you want one sentence, <laughs> it's always difficult. Um, it's not just about funding, but I think it's, you know, apply, the f apply funding to things that are really going to make a difference for learners so that learners, no learner is left behind. You know, so, so put your money where it's needed, put, put finance where it's needed for those learners who necessarily are disadvantaged. So that's not one sentence, but you know, I just, sometimes I think we throw money at, at all sorts of things, but it's not necessarily coherent. So more coherent funding to make technology work for every learner. Thank so you. I would say, again, difficult in a sentence, but we've currently got uh, a consultation around curriculum and assessment yes. review. I think it's a, it's a real opportunity for everyone across the educational space, and that includes learners themselves, teachers, uh, employers, everybody involved, to talk about the importance of digital within the curriculum. So we have in Wales an example of English and maths and digital skills as essential skills. Yeah. That is the case in England in T-levels, but not across the no. whole curriculum. True. So I think it's a real opportunity, and I'm going to use the broad term digital, that could be AI, it could be whatever's coming next, because we don't know what's going to happen in five years' time. So use the curriculum assessment um, review as an opportunity to state the importance of digital because it is a, a, an enabler to education and an enabler to inclusion. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Maxine. And thank you to our listeners. Um, if you want to find out more about our work, visit our website, www.gisc.ac.uk, where you can click the AI section to find out about our work on AI and also join our AI community with more than a thousand educators working with AI. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thank you.